to take part in communion, and then later on to listen to uh, his word and a message from Jacob. If you haven't already gotten your communion elements, you can find them in the lobby. Uh, we're asking that if you have any prayer requests, to so please send them to office at trivalleychurch.org, or you can also go onto our website. Also a reminder that the giving or your offering can be done on our website. It could also be sent by mail, or in the back right there, there is a box where you can uh, drop those off. A reminder that this Saturday, October 9th, at 8 o'clock at Burnell Community Park, there's going to be a fundraising event for Healing Hands International. This is a joint event with the Pleasant View Church of Christ, so look in the bulletin for more information. And lastly, we're looking for some volunteers to work a couple hours in the church office. So if you are available to do that, please see Jacob. Thank you. Okay. Our next song is Behold Our God. And after this song, Brittany Wallach has a scripture reading for us. Mm. Who has held the oceans in his hand? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Who has given? to the Lord, who can question any of his words, who can teach the one who knows all things, who can fathom all his wondrous deeds. Who has felt the nails of 
3.3. And now, children, stay with Christ. Live deeply in Christ. Then we'll be ready for him when he appears, ready to receive him with open arms, with no cause for red-faced guilt or lame excuses when he arrives. Once you're convinced that he is right and righteous, you'll recognize that all who practice righteousness are God's true children. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called children of God. That's who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously, because it has no idea who he is or what he's up to. But friends, that's exactly who we are, children of God. And that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him, and in seeing him, become like him. All of us who look forward to his coming, stay ready with the glistening purity of Jesus's life as a model for our own. Amen. Our next song is Come Let Us All Unite to Sing. After this song, Dave Yeaman will lead us in prayer. Come, Come let us all unite to sing God is love Let heaven and earth the praises ring God is love Let every soul from sin awake Each in his heart sweet music make And sing with Little children, will you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within me because you said it would. I obey the commands of Jesus, frail as I am as a human. Sure, I make mistakes, 
but that doesn't mean you've left me. I thank you for the presence in my life of the great Holy Spirit. And as you promised, Jesus, you are in me and I am in you. And if that's true, then I am in God and God is in me. And the Holy Spirit, you said, was in me, is in me, and I am in the Spirit. I thank you so much for being the one who speaks through me so I don't have any don't have to make any lame excuses I am your little child and I, I relish the love that I've been given not only as a gift to me but as a gift I can give to others I thank you for the way that you show me to speak for you, for your glory. What a blessing to have this confidence, this transformed life. I just need no embarrassment. Just feel the spirit as I deal with people. And thank you, Lord, for this uh, great treasure that we all have. And I pray for our frailties. They're there. We sin. And we are forgiven. It is the love that you have for us. Please give us opportunities to uh, do everything in your will. The praise. The please for our dear brothers and sisters who are struggling with various health issues. I know that many of them feel the peace of God within them. And that's my prayer for them too, that they have that peace. Forgive us as we uh, fail you in the future, as we go forth and Ignore the opportunities or just plain don't recognize them. We're asking for new eyes to see the new opportunities. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the Lord's Supper, let's sing in Christ alone. Yeah. 
say Sin's curse has lost its grip on me For I am His and He is mine Bought with the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ. I Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll Opportunity to remember Jesus. We thank you for the life of Jesus. We thank you for the heart of Jesus. Thank you for his words, his commands, his words of life that can guide our lives and give us life even today. We thank you for the fellowship that we have in communion, that we are all guests at the table of Christ. And that as the song says, we were bought with his precious blood. He reserved a seat at the table for us and made the sacrifice so that we can be in a restored and renewed relationship with you. We're so thankful for that. Our songs are joyful this morning because our hearts are joyful for the salvation that we have in Christ. And as we reflect on that, I pray that it will animate us and empower us to go into the world this week and to do good works in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask this, we pray this, and we offer our thanks in his holy name. Amen. Good morning, folks. My name is Jacob Parnell, and I'm the preaching minister here. At this time, I want to go ahead and dismiss our young children to head over to kids' worship. We do this every week during the sermon time. Rod's got a comment.
Oh, yeah, if you have uh, garbage, uh, there's some folks coming around with uh, little trash cans. Is that what you were indicating? Is there more? We have. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can go ahead and participate in that now. Kiddos can go over to the Family Life Center for their Bible lessons. I want to give a big thanks to Kelly and to Robert, who are our kids' worship teachers this fall. Can we give a, a applause of thanks to them? I am thankful for them and uh, having kids in the program myself. I'm so glad for what they're doing over there. It's great. They're getting to, to know the Bible, to know how God works, to, to get to worship together and be with kids their own age. So they're still there. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Robert. You guys are awesome. Uh, a couple other quick reminders that uh, things that Trish mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, we, we, we thank you guys for your, your financial contributions to the congregation to enable us to continue to do the good works in the name of Jesus. And if you'd like to make a contribution, if you'd like to participate in giving, there's three ways to do that. You can uh, write a check to and put it in the box back there or uh, mail it into the church or you can always go online and give digitally. It's fancy and amazing all these things we can do with our phones these days. So thank you guys for your faithful contributions. And then she also mentioned the walk for water. This is something that we've been advertising. It's been in the newsletter. It's been here up on the screen and online uh, for the past month or so. And it's a joint effort between the Tri-Valley Church of Christ and the Pleasant View Church of Christ. Uh, my buddy over there, Chris Kearney, is the minister. They did this fundraising event, well, I don't know if it was last year, but they did it uh, a couple of years ago. COVID kind of throws everything off. Um, but they meet at the park, and then they walk. And it's to, to fundraise for people in the world who don't have fresh water. And the money that we raise is going to drill a freshwater uh, uh, well and help out some people on the other side of the globe. So if you want to participate in that, you can go online and you can register. If you register, you get a cool t-shirt that says walk for water. Whether or not you think you can do the walk, it's two miles there and two miles back, uh, you can still show up and you can hang out. I've got a bum knee. I'm still getting over an injury. I don't know if I could do all four miles, but I'm going to go there and I'm going to clap for people and I'm going to encourage folks and I'm going to try to help raise funds for this uh, good cause. So this coming Saturday morning, if you're able to make it, please come out and join us at Bernal Community Park over in Pleasanton. Uh, anything else? Did I forget anything else? Yes. No, don't say. I don't think so. There's a, our groups, our two churches together. He asked if there's like a goal, like a fundraising top goal. Yeah, we raise money and then they, they drill a well. Pleasant View and Tri-Valley are partnering together. And as a group, we have a set goal. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but ask me for more information. We'll go to the website and check that out. Ah, I wish I knew. That's a good question. Any other questions that I may or may not have the answers to while we're... Q&Aing, anything? I'm totally, I'm totally open. I, I didn't write a sermon, so this is going to be the whole 30 minutes. <laughs> Just kidding, I, I do. I've got, some, I've got some prepared remarks. But hopefully uh, we'll spend more of our time listening to Jesus than listening to Jacob. We're in a series called Words of Life, uh, The Commands of Jesus. And we've been just hearing the things that Jesus commanded his followers. What, what are we supposed to do? What does it look like to be faithful to Jesus? And this morning we are going to hear him say, remain in me. Or you might be familiar with the, the older translation that says, abide in me. So let's listen to the words of Jesus now from John chapter 15. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. 
showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus gives the command to remain nine times in this chapter. Remain in me, remain in the vine, remain in my love, remain in my Father's love. He is telling us something is important about this concept for us to remain in him. Stay with me. Like I said, some, some older translations, the old KJV, and I think the ESV says, abide with me. I think that's a helpful word for us to understand what is Jesus talking about here. I thought about it. There's two different ways that the word abide gets used. There's kind of like the way that people used to say it more often back in the day and the way you'll hear it more often nowadays. Let's start with abide as an old-timey term. Abide used to just mean like live with me. It has to do with your house, about staying near to me. Abide with me. Stay close to me. And I think it's important for us to understand that that's how God feels about us. Jesus is just communicating something that has been true about God throughout the history of God's relationship with his people. We're in John chapter 15, but if you go back one chapter, John 14, you hear Jesus saying, in my father's house, there are many rooms and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. This concept of abiding with God. But this goes back even farther than John 14. God has a history of wanting his people to live near him, close to him, in harmony and in partnership with him. You go back to the very beginning, the stuff that the kids have been learning about last month in their kids' worship, Adam and Eve in the garden. God creates this place, not so that they can have fun and you know, write in postcards about how it's going, but it's a place where God can be near his beloved creation. I want to be close with you. I want to walk and talk with you. And then the Israelites, they're slaves in Egypt. God brings them out into the wilderness. Again, not so that they can go, woo, it's better to be free than to be a slave. It's so that he could, they can be with God, be close to him, meet me in the desert. That's where our relationship is going to continue. When Israel wanted a king, everybody else has a king. We want to have a king too. Can we have a king? God says, well, why don't, I'll be your king. I, you should trust in me. I'm the best ruler that you'll ever get. They didn't really like that so much. God allowed them to have something that wasn't going to be the best for them, but still wanting to be in relationship with them. I will be your king. You will be my people. I will be faithful to you. And even when they weren't faithful to God, he didn't say, well, I warned you. See you later. God is the God who runs after his people. He chases them down. He woos them back. He wins them over. He invites them and says, I'm never going to give up on you. I love you so much. A couple weekends ago at our homecoming event, Friday night, we had a campfire devotional. And I told us the story about the prodigal son that Jesus tells us. And we pointed out this story could also be called the story of the prodigal God because it's a story mostly about the father who waits for the son, who when he sees the son returning, he goes out to him, he hugs him, he restores him, he welcomes him back and celebrates the return of the son. Jesus tells us, that's a picture of God and how much God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. So abiding in Christ has to do with being close, being in close relationship, being in step with God and God's spirit. And then the new way that people talk about abiding more so than they used to, abiding and living with somebody, is uh, it's more about rules. It's about following the rules. You need to abide by these rules and these policies. And we may like the first one and not so much the second one, but I think both of them are helpful in understanding what Jesus is saying here. Abide with me, be in close relationship with me, but I'm giving you these commands because there's a certain way that I expect you to live. And it's not because I want to control you, it's because I want to empower you. I want you to become the best version of yourself. Jesus knows that his commands are words that will bring life to those who carry them out. And the people who listen to them and do things like actually loving their neighbors, actually forgiving others, actually repenting and making changes when you realize you're off track, actually being open to receiving the Holy Spirit, they discover this. Jesus describes the broad road that leads to destruction, and many people will choose that road, then the narrow way that leads to life. And he's calling people to abide with him in the close relationship sense, but also in the stay in the lines sense because this is where I'm going. I want you to follow me along a path that I'm leading for you. 
And we know that being in Christ is connected to abidings in Jesus' teachings because he goes on to tell us this. Here's a little bit more from John 15 for you. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go out and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in the father's name, I will give you. This is my command. Love each other. So being in Christ, what does that mean? You might think, ah, being in Christ is like a, a location. I'm in the church, I'm, or I'm in Livermore, I'm in the grocery store, or maybe even I'm in church or I'm in worship. Uh, but it's not as much of a location as it out of being in a committed relationship with Jesus. God is firmly committed to his people, and he calls us to be committed to him as well. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a, a, a romantic relationship or known someone who has, but there usually comes a part when you're starting to date or decide whether or not this relationship is going to continue, and you have this moment that's called a DTR moment or a DTR conversation. Does anybody know what DTR stands for? No, you haven't. You need to have this conversation. It's pretty important. Uh, Lisa, what does it stand for? DTR is define the relationship. It's where people will sit down and say, okay, like, uh, are we boyfriend, girlfriend? Are we serious? Are we exclusive? Are we, like, what are we? We need to define this relationship. Well, the good news for us is in a relationship with God, whenever you have a DTR with God, he wants you to know, I'm in. I'm committed. I am for you. I am willing to do what it takes. I'm in. Like, you tell me because I have made that commitment to you. I have demonstrated my love for you, my willingness to sacrifice for you in my son, Jesus Christ. Jesus in this passage is reminding us, I'm in, but how about you? Are you in for this relationship? He tells us what being uh, in means and what it looks like. It means being committed to Jesus. It means listening and obeying his commands. Remember the, the Shema, not just hearing, but doing making it a part of your life. It means bearing kingdom fruit, having a joy that is complete, he tells us here. It means calling on the Lord for help, and you may have noticed this in the verse, it means loving one another. We're kind of making a little pile of what it means to be in Christ here. And I'm going to listen in for some of uh, Paul's wisdom in the New Testament letters. He's going to add to that understanding of what it means to be in Christ. One of the things means there's no condemnation. For those who are in Christ. Romans 8, the first two verses. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So being in Christ means no condemnation. You cannot be condemned by the accuser. It also means being chosen and redeemed by God. Ephesians chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Are you feeling the love? Those are things that we said earlier. Like, th this is true. And one more thing from Paul. He says, being in Christ means being part of the body of Christ. He talks about the church in Romans chapter 12. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ... We, though many, form one body, 
and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Okay, got kind of a nice little pile here. Being in Christ sounds like a pretty good thing to me. This sounds like something you should want to be in. Thinking about the DTR conversation and people going back and forth saying, you know, what's this relationship going to be? It's one thing for Jacob to come along and say, you really should be in a relationship with me because it's going to be in your best interest. You are going to have a great time. I'm going to be an awesome person to be in a relationship with. That sounds a little bit arrogant. That sounds maybe a little bit desperate. But when God does it, when Jesus talks about being in him and being committed to that relationship and saying, it is in your best interest to do this, he's not just trying to sell you a used car. He's not just coming off as desperate and needing something in his life. There, there's, God has no need whatsoever. God is completely realized. We exist because God wanted to create us. This whole world is an is a expression, an outpouring of the love that Father, Son, and Spirit have for one another. I'm sorry if this bursts your bubble a little bit. God does not need you, but he chose you. He loves you, and he's committed to you. And when God says, it is in your best interest to be in Christ, he is just stating a fact. This is the best relationship you will ever have. It is something that you will quite literally be lost without. Christians are people who have said yes to that offer, to being in Christ, to following Jesus. And once you've done that, the call then is to remain in Christ. And you'll notice when we heard from John 15, Jesus uses this image of branches and a vine. And the difference between a branch that is connected to the vine and one that is separated from the vine. He talks about pruning, and we'll get to that in just a second. I've got, I've got a, a branch here that is disconnected from its vine. I found this out in the yard. This maybe was green at one time. These uh, branches were maybe flexible at one time, but now it kind of just, they snap off. I'm going to hold this close to my microphone, and maybe you'll be able to hear this, but can you hear what this sounds like? Oh, well, there's even dust that's coming off of that. <laughs> this thing is super dead. It's, it's the crunchiness of the branch that's been disconnected from the vine. And this is an important image for us to hold on to because Jesus says, if you remain in me, this isn't going to happen to you. You're not going to be as brittle. You're not going to be as fragile and breakable and kind of useless. Oh, you know what's good for? You can start a pretty good fire. This will get a good fire going, right? We'll toss that on there and kind of warm things up. Jesus says, that's not my hope. That's not my desire for any of my children. I want you to stay connected to the vine. I want you to bear fruit. This is important. I want you to remain in me. And I think that's something we can agree to and say, good, we should remain in Christ. We have this understanding of what being in Christ looks like. This is our goal as Christians. But I think it's a challenge for us, especially today, because consistency is something that we often struggle with. And remaining is not as interesting and exciting sometimes as changing or trying something else. I think we all suffer from time to time from a case of restlessness and just wondering what a different option would be. Think of a few examples that we've seen in the last 12 to 18 months. I was reading an article about the great resignation of 2021. I don't know if you've heard this term before. The great resignation. A lot of people are quitting their jobs. A lot of people are changing careers in ways and in amounts that we haven't seen before. One statistic from back in July said that 40% of Americans are considering or taking steps to quit their jobs. And that is, that is huge. That is a major change, I think. The events of the last 18 months have made a lot of people realize, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Or like, I've always wanted to do this, but I've never stepped out and done it. A lot of people are just doing it. They're going for it. There's this major shift that's happening 
in uh, career paths. Another example is I think about statistics I've seen from church denominational loyalty. Uh, in 1955, one statistic said that one out of every 25 people will change church denominations within their lifetime, uh, one time. And usually the maximum was one time. One in 25 people. Uh, nowadays, the statistic is about one in every two people. That is a huge jump. People will say, you know what? I grew up as a, a Baptist, but now I'm, I don't know, Roman Catholic. Or I grew up in the Church of Christ, and now I'm going to a non-denominational church. People just aren't staying uh, where they were planted anymore. And think of a third example. How many people do you know who have moved out of state or relocated in the past two or three years? They're like, hey, man, this is our opportunity. We're going to bounce. See ya. These three examples, I want you to know, none of these are bad things. I'm not saying, ah, oh, people shouldn't quit their jobs. Ah, oh, people shouldn't change churches to go to a more faithful congregation. That, these are not bad things. These are just observations about the world that we're living in and examples of we're feeling a little bit more restless. We're leaning more into change than into remaining, which is what Christ calls us to do. But here's the good news. If people are not in Christ and there's this big wave, there's this big movement toward changing things, that's great because a lot of people are considering coming and worshiping the Lord in church in ways that they never have before. They're opening their Bibles and saying, I want to know more about this Jesus that my neighbors have kind of introduced me to, but I've never bothered to look before. That is excellent news. And I could tell you stories about people who have come to me and said like, okay, I wasn't ready to listen before, but I'm listening now. What does following Jesus look like? Such good news. But if you're somebody who's been in Christ for a long time, if you've been following Jesus, and the call is remain in me, like I said, that can be a bit of an uphill challenge. But the good news is you don't have to do this alone. And Jesus reminding us to love one another, being in the Father, he is in me and I am in you. It's, this, it's communal language. We don't have to try to figure this out or accomplish it perfectly on our own. The way Jesus connects staying connected to the vine and loving each other shows us remaining in Christ is something that is both an individual thing, you got to kind of own it, you have to do it, but it's also communal. You can do this in a church, in the body of Christ. Our individual responsibility to stay connected to Christ, to keep his commandments, to love our neighbors, that's something we have to own. But we also have make a communal effort to do this in the church, to model faithfulness for one another, to encourage and pray for people who are struggling. I like this church. I don't know if you do, but one of the things that I really like about this church is that we take community seriously. It's the beauty of a congregation like Tri-Valley, is simple things that maybe we take for granted, like the prayer list and the meal train and the Sunday gathering and the midweek meetings and the church directory and the baby shower and the wedding and the funeral. These things connect us to one another so that we can stay connected to Jesus Christ, the true vine and the true source of life. It's good words. This series is great because we just hear the commands of Jesus and go, yes, okay, this is a great reminder. Let's go and live it out. I want to give you one tool as I wrap things up here this morning. Uh, one tool to help us remind us that Staying in the vine and remaining in Christ is an individual thing and also a communal thing. It's an exercise that I want to encourage you to do on your own and in uh, the, a, a small group, maybe with the people you live with, maybe with the people around you. And it's an activity that's called roses and thorns. Everybody turn to the person next to you and say, roses and thorns. Okay, now turn back to that person and say, what is that? Okay, now, if, now explain it to the person. No, I'll just explain it to everybody. Roses and Thorns is a simple activity that you can do on your own or with somebody else where you think back on the last day or the last week of your life and you say, I'm going to identify one rose, and that's a time when I felt close to God. And I'm also going to identify one thorn, and that's a time when I felt farther away from God. You might, have heard, you might have done an activity like highs and lows, go around the dinner table, give me one high from your day and one low. It's similar to that. But the goal here is to identify something in your life, not just that was good or bad, but why. 
And where was your proximity to the vine in that moment? So you might say, man, when my rose for yesterday was just getting to come home after running some errands. And my kids came up to me and they jumped on me and they gave me hugs. And then we sat around and we just kind of shared what we did in our day. Wow, that was really, that was a high point. That was the rose in my day. Well, why? I mean, I think I was doing what I should have been doing. I was being a good, good dad. I was being attentive. I wasn't like on my phone going, Whoa, blah, blah, blah. I was like feeling the love and just like leaning into who I'm supposed to be in Christ. That was a rose in my day. Okay, I might say, well, what was a thorn in my day, my week? Well, maybe this one has to do with my family as well. Maybe I lost my patience and I, I yelled at my kids. I snapped at them. You can see the look on their face like, ooh, ooh, boy. <laughs> kind of like walked away to give me some space. Well, I was at a low point. Well, because I wasn't really, that's not who I want to be. I don't think that, was, I wasn't showing patience or self-control or managing the anger well. It, it wasn't very Christ-like. And the, the, the goal here is not to go like, good for me or bad for me. It's just to identify these rhythms of your day. If you start to do this over the course of a few days or a few weeks, you might start to notice a pattern. Wow, all of my roses happen first thing in the morning, and all of my thorns happen right at the end of the day before dinner. <laughs> so I'm tired, and I'm cranky, and I'm hungry, and I'm unpleasant. Oh, okay, well, maybe there's something I can do in my life to keep these thorns from being so thorny, increase the chances that these roses will bloom. Does it make sense? Did I explain it well? Roses and thorns. It's a simple activity. It's actually an adaptation of something that's been around for like five centuries. It's called the Ignatian Examine. This guy, Ignatius of Loyola in the 1500s, just kind of came up with this way of reflecting on your day, trying to figure out what is your proximity to Christ. He called them consolations and desolations of the soul. But I think it's easier to remember calling them roses and thorns. So I want you to do this. I would like you guys to commit to doing this each day this week. Again, whether you do it on your own or you do it with somebody that you can call or somebody that you live with, or just the people that you normally interact with. Just take a moment and ask them, like, give me one rose and one thorn from your day. Okay, and then just talk about that. I'd like you to do this once a day for this coming week and just see how that helps you remain in Christ. And... It's up to you whether or not you do that. You could remember and go, I'll do it. Or you could say, I don't do that kind of stuff, so never mind. But just because I think it's important to do it all, I'm going to invite you all to do this right now. And so I would like you to take the next four minutes, and we'll put a timer up here on the screen, and just turn to somebody near you and say, what's one rose in your day? What's or one thorn in your day or in your last week? And give them a chance to respond. Here's the rules, you guys. If some, you turn to somebody and they take out their phone or they get up to go to the bathroom, that means they're not interested in playing. You can't force them. I'm not going to force you guys. But I am going to invite you now to share one rose and one thorn. Go. Thank you guys for, uh, for, for doing this activity. See how simple it is? Uh, identify those those roses, those things that make, it, make you feel closer to God, and those thorns, those things that make you feel farther, and try to figure out why. Um, you guys are awesome. I appreciate you. Let, let me close this out in prayer, and while the praise team makes their way back up here, gets ready to lead us in our, our last song this morning. God, uh, thank you for Jesus, the true vine. I believe that his words are true. I believe they're worth remembering uh, and memorizing and... Uh, putting to practice in our lives. Give us more roses. Let us be intentional about leaning into you, to drawing close to you and, and remaining in Christ. And uh, help us to work on those thorns. Help us to uh, hear each other's thorns, these, these words of confession saying, hey, we don't have it all together. We don't have it all figured out, but we want to be more like Jesus. So God, give us opportunity, the courage, and your spirit's empowerment to help us do that on a daily basis. Uh, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Please stand. Don't be so Jesus is
Please be seated. This time we're going to have um, prayers, and I'm going to share with you some of the prayer requests that have come in this week. Uh, we have several from um, Justin here, um, Maureen. Gutierrez, uh, one of his family members, has asked for uh, prayers for healing as she undergoes lymphoma treatments. And then his aunt, Tia Emilia, uh, just lost her husband after almost 75 years of marriage. And it says, praise God for their long life together, but also for comfort for, for his aunt in this time of her loss of her husband and partner. And then... Uh, I guess we also had uh, this morning, Trish, several of your family members have come down with COVID, including your mother. Uh, so we need to continue to pray for uh, that family. I guess a mother and a couple sisters, maybe. Yeah, so uh, keep all Trish's uh, family in prayer as they uh, uh, deal with the COVID. Uh, also, we're, I think all of us are aware that Darren McRandall is in the hospital uh, struggling with COVID. And... Uh, uh, just still having a very difficult time. Uh, he is on a ventilator now to help him breathe as well as being um, on a feeding tube. So things are still very serious there. We need to keep uh, not just Darren in our prayers, but the whole McRandall family. And there'll be more information in the prayer requests that come out this week uh, about that. But continue to pray for them as well as uh, the doctors and nurses that are caring for uh, Darren and just uh, the many decisions that uh, Sandra has to handle at home now, things that she's 
not been familiar and comfortable with that she's having to make decisions about. Uh, so just keep, keep them in, the pra- in our prayers. Uh, Jan Hignan asks that we pray for Al's niece, Debbie Santalinas. Jan says that's close enough. Uh, she had surgery on Thursday to remove kidney stones. Uh, also with COVID, um, Levon Cybern asks us to pray for her daughter-in-law, Sandra, uh, who has COVID. And then also, um, Levon and her sisters had a recent kind of sisters reunion, and several of her sisters have come down with COVID. I'm not, I'm not sure if Levon has it or not. She does say in her request, we all feel pretty good so far. So I don't know if that means that she also has it and uh, they just aren't having severe symptoms at this point. But let's continue to keep uh, LaVon and her family in our prayers. And let me double check. I think I may have one more. Nope, I think I have them all. So let's uh, spend some time in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, our God, our healer, Father, we're humbled in your presence, uh, knowing that we are in your hands. Father, we pray for those that I've listed who are um, dealing with the infection of COVID at this point. Father, pray that you bring healing, you bring protection for the families and caregivers that are around them. Father, we especially want to bring Darren McRandall before you. Uh, He's been struggling with the effects of COVID for for some time now, and although he doesn't have the disease at this point, the effects can linger for a long time. Father, we just pray for for his healing. We also pray for his family, that they can find peace, uh, that they can rest assured that he is in in your hands and that uh, you are also there to show them love and bring comfort. Father, we pray for the others I've mentioned who are sick uh, or been through surgeries. Father, you are the great healer. Uh, you don't just heal our physical infirmities, but Father, you, you heal us from the other many emotional and spiritual struggles we have. And Father, we're so, so grateful to be your children. We're so grateful that you're a loving Father. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that He not only came to show us who you are and how you love us, but he came to die for our sins as the greatest act of love. Father, we're thankful that through him we have forgiveness. Father, it's in his name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.